This is chapter five, Dimensional Analysis and Similarity, part one. In this video, I thought I'd give just a very brief introduction to the concepts of similarity and dimensional analysis. You've already encountered a similarity parameter in this course. It's called the Reynolds number. You've encountered it particularly in lab number two, where we talked about flow transition in a pipe. And so in this video, I'll give a visual example of similarity. I'll talk about the flow regimes for flow over a cylinder. And then I'll end with a practical example of similarity and how dimensional analysis can be used to greatly simplify the characterization of aerodynamic drag on a cylinder. I've taken this slide from one of the very early videos you already should be familiar with the Reynolds number. Uh, the flow regime, for example, in a pipe depends upon the Reynolds number. You learned this in lab two. You learned that when the Reynolds number is less than about 2300, you get laminar flow. And above that, you tend to get turbulent flow where the velocities in the pipe are, are random and you get a lot of mixing. And it doesn't matter what the velocity is in the pipe, what the specific diameter is, what the density is, or what the viscosity is. It's the ratio of those parameters uh, that determine the flow regime. And in this chapter, we'll explain where this important result comes from. So let me start by talking about something you already know a little bit about, flow regimes. I'm going to talk about flow regimes over a cylinder you've seen in lab number one, laminar flow over a sphere, which is very similar. So at a Reynolds number less than one, for a cylinder, you get Stokes flow. So very steady laminar flow and no flow separation. So in this picture, the flow is from, is from left to right. And then as the Reynolds number increases, so when you get above one, substantially above one, you get flow separation. So this is a, this picture is taken at a Reynolds number of 28, and there's been a little bit of smoke introduced into the flow, and we can see the streamlines here because this is a steady flow. And so at higher Reynolds number, we actually get flow separation, and this is the separation point. And what happens at that point is that flow departs the cylinder, and if you're inside the this recirculation zone here, flow is actually drawn in the opposite direction towards the separation point. This is probably more detail than I need to mention here, but the, the wall shear stress is zero at a separation point. And then if you increase the Reynolds number even more, this is at 41, you get a very similar pattern. Separation occurs at the very similar point, but the recirculated flow region gets longer, and this is about the limit of for steady flow. Beyond this, you start to get oscillating flows. Somewhere around a Reynolds number of 60, you start to get alternating vortex shedding. And I've shown this picture, I think, in one of the end slides from my previous presentations. This is some flow visualization of a, a cylinder in cross flow at a Reynolds number of about 140. And so the top picture is a flow visualization experiment, and the lower picture is a CFD prediction of that vortex shedding where the colors represent fluid velocity. And so at higher Reynolds numbers you get a separated flow with alternating vortex shedding and again this is probably more information than I need but it's just you might find it interesting to know that this phenomenon is called a, a von Karman vortex street after a quite a famous uh, fluid dynamics researcher. And that's the reason why very tall chimneys tend to have these spiraled vortex breakers to disturb that steady vortex shedding because it would, it would uh, cause the chimney to vibrate. And then when you go to even higher Reynolds numbers, here's a, a Reynolds number of 10,000, you get a very similar flow. The separation point moves a little bit forward on the cylinder, and you've still got vortex shedding, but the, the uh, vortex shedding here becomes turbulent. And you'll notice in this discussion of the flow regimes for a cylinder in cross flow that I've not mentioned any of the what I would say are specifics. I've not mentioned the fluid velocity, the particular diameter, the density or viscosity. 
all of those things that the flow depends upon for a real situation. But amazingly, uh, we can show, and we will show in, the, in this chapter, that this problem can be reduced to one dimensional parameter called the Reynolds number. And it's only the ratio of those parameters of density, velocity, diameter divided by viscosity that matters in terms of determining the flow. So just to be clear, I've shown a picture here of the vortex shedding you get at a Reynolds number of 140 where you get this unsteady laminar flow with alternating vortices. And the point that I want to make is that it doesn't matter what fluid you're dealing with, what the size of the cylinder is, and I've listed here various conditions that correspond to a Reynolds number of 140. So whether you have water with a one centimeter diameter cylinder going at 0 0.014 meters per second, or you have a more viscous oil going over the same cylinder at a much higher velocity, you have the same Reynolds number, you get exactly the same flow. So this flow that we see in the above picture would occur for all of these situations. So water, oil, air with a one centimeter diameter cylinder going at 0.21 meters per second would produce the same image. And if we took air, we made the cylinder smaller. So if we reduce D here by a factor of 10, we could increase the velocity here by a factor of 10 to maintain the Reynolds number of 140, and you get exactly the same uh, flow pattern. And so in this chapter of the textbook, we will discuss how this similarity parameter and others come about, and we'll be using something called dimensional analysis to do that. Now, the previous example was just sort of a visual example of flow regimes over a cylinder. So I want to talk about something more concrete. Imagine if you wanted to determine the aerodynamic drag force on a cylinder. That's important for all kinds of applications. It might not be a cylinder, it might be the drag force on a car. But for this example, let's consider a cylinder. So once again, the, uh, the drag force on a smooth cylinder in a flow, so we have some, some fluid flowing at velocity v, and we're trying to calculate the, the drag on that, on that cylinder, it would depend upon the fluid velocity, it would depend upon the size of the cylinder, its diameter, it would depend upon the fluid properties, so what the density of the fluid is and what the viscosity of the fluid is. So given that you, 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 know, you hadn't heard about uh, similarity parameters, how would you go about? How would the first person to have thought about this problem characterize the drag force? Well, you know, logically, one way to do it is to run a number of experiments. So you'd set up a cylinder of a particular size, so you'd have a particular D, and you'd put it in a wind tunnel and measure uh, the velocity and measure the drag force uh, as a function of that velocity, and you'd have a fixed fluid. Maybe you do it in air for the first time and you get a curve of drag force versus velocity with the other three variables held constant. And then you could repeat this. You could measure the drag force and vary the cylinder diameter while holding the density, viscosity, and velocity constant. So you could build a number of different models. And then perhaps you could run other experiments where you vary the fluid density, but you hold velocity, viscosity, and, and diameter constant, and on and on, right? So now we vary fluid viscosity, but hold density, velocity, and diameter constant. And even just going through these slides, you can see it's quite uh, time-consuming. And to do this, to do all these experiments, would be expensive and time-consuming, and indeed sometimes difficult. Imagine trying to run experiments where you hold the viscosity constant, uh, oh, sorry, you vary the viscosity, but you have a constant fluid density. That uh, could be difficult to achieve. And indeed, if you did all these experiments, how would you put these results together in a useful way? And luckily, there's a better way, as you've probably gathered from this video. It's called dimensional analysis, and we're going to talk about it in the next video in detail. And so to end, I thought I'd 
I show you a practical example of dimensional analysis. What we're considering here is that same problem, aerodynamic drag on cylinders and spheres. And to show the power of dimensional analysis, what I'm showing you here is a preview of a result, which we're going to demonstrate in an upcoming video. Using dimensional analysis, you can show that the dimensionless drag force per unit length of the cylinder can be shown to be only a function of the Reynolds number. So what we have here is the drag force, F drag, divided by another force, rho V squared upon 2 is the stagnation pressure at the front stagnation point of the cylinder, times the area gives the, 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 the pressure force on the cylinder. So we're non-dimensionalizing, so that force over the stagnation pressure force gives you a dimensionless parameter, and on the horizontal axis we have the Reynolds number, and when you non-dimensionalize the results in this way, you only have to do one single experiment you get a single curve for any fluid, for any velocity, and any cylinder size, which is really an amazing result. And so, of course, it depends on geometry, so you get a, another single curve for a sphere and a single curve for a cylinder. You're not responsible for, the, uh, for this result at the moment, but it demonstrates the tremendous power of dimensional analysis and what we're going to be discussing in the remainder of the chapter. And that completes this video. I usually end with something that's unrelated but cool, uh, related to fluid mechanics, and that's what I've got here. This is a, a real-time CFD calculator that's based on a JavaScript. The link's below if you're interested. And if you, what's cool is when you, when you go to this link, if you, you can use your mouse to stir a fluid with a small cylinder, and you can see all the vortices that it produces. And this is all in real time, so you can move the mouse as you like, and you see the, uh, the eddies that are generated. So you can swirl your mouse in a circle and see the flow patterns that it creates. It's really quite amazing that it does this in, in real time.